Since the dawn of time, there has been but one question that has torn humanity asunder. One unsolved mystery that has sparked countless battles across playgrounds and social media platforms alike. More than Superman versus Batman, peanut butter or jelly, is a hot dog a sandwich, what color is the dress, the last Jedi, just all of it, that one math problem, man, man, we really argue about a lot of dumb stuff on here, don't we? But above all, the one unsolved question that has perplexed scholars and scientists the world over is a simple one on the surface, yet it hides fathomless layers of complexity beneath. Who would win in a fight? One of every Pokemon or one billion lions? Many arguments have been waged over this age-old battle, but I say this war has gone on for long enough. Today, I prove beyond a shadow of a doubt using cold, hard data and science who would win this fight. A lot of you said you missed the super math-heavy episodes. Well, be careful what you wish for. There'll be no running jokes or elaborate setups or witty commentary today. For a subject as important and divisive as this, there is only room for the truth. And maybe a couple of jokes. Richard, hit that intro. As complex as the arguments around this problem often become, the question itself is actually quite simple, and I'm sure you've already had an answer pop into your head that you're ready to die for. On one side, we have one of every single Pokemon. At the time of recording, that's 1,015 unique types of Pokemon, ranging from literal gods to, a, to literally just a fish. Now, obviously, the Pokemon are severely outnumbered, but they have the added benefit of all sorts of magical attacks, from shooting fire to creating earthquakes at a moment's notice. Seems like some pretty powerful stuff. And on the other side, we have lions. Just your regular old run-of-the-mail Panthera Leo lions. They may not have any special abilities outside of just being a lion, but they do have the added advantage of there's a billion of them. Now, to be fully transparent, I've always been on the side of the lions because, again, there's a billion of them, but I've never sat down and did the math, so I am going in today with a fully open mind and am totally willing to be proven wrong. My plan is to run through all the math to prove which group will emerge victorious. It's gonna be great, it's a lot of geometry, very low stress, you'll love it. We all love geometry, right? No? No one, no one, just me? First though, I want to address a couple of common arguments that often come up when talking about this and debunk them real quick so my comment section isn't flooded with um actuallys. A lot of people will point to the Pokedex to try and get a sense of what Pokemon would be like in real life, which... <laughs> Oh, it's not, it's not, you're, too, you're too much. No, that thing is completely wrong. It was canonically written by some 12-year-old Zoomer who got sent back in time. No, Megcargo is not 18,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Chestnut isn't strong enough to flip a tank. And Yamask isn't the ghost of a dead guy who cut off his own face. That last one's got nothing to do with the fight. I just hate it. But speaking of ghosts, a lot of people will say that the lions could never touch any of the ghost type Pokemon because they're immune to normal type attacks. But it's been canon for 20 plus years that if you bite a ghost, it's dead. So problem solved. There's also the question of the flying and levitating Pokemon. How could the lions ever reach something like Deoxys? Which, and admittedly, that is a fair question and one that I will come back to later. So hold on to it. I've also seen a lot of people just making stuff up for the Pokemon, like there's some nine-year-old trying to win at make-believe superheroes with things like, um, actually, uh, Arceus can just 
destroy the entire world and all the lions in an instant, so I mean, obviously the Pokemon would win. And I'm sitting here like, what? That thing that I killed with a bee barrel? Arceus is one of the strongest Pokemon, to be sure. But it's not that good. I know it's supposed to be the god of the Pokemon world, but if it does have the power to pull a full Galactus on this Marvel Snap game, I've never seen it. The coolest thing I've seen it do was create a new legendary Pokemon egg, and that was a one-time deal. Heck, even the Pokedex, which says with pure confidence that this lava slug is hotter than the surface of the sun is hesitant to actually call Arceus a god, saying things like, it is told in mythology that it was the first Pokemon born before the universe ever existed. It never says that it definitely was. This thing, oh yeah, yeah, that's hotter than the sun for sure, but, but this guy creating the universe? Don't be crazy, that's just speculation, man. And let's be honest, if the accuracy of our real world mythology is anything to go by, Arceus is probably just some big deer that hangs out on the top of this mountain and likes making your cell phone too bulky to comfortably fit in your pocket. If you're allowed to say that this thing has the power to destroy the planet, uh, then, uh, well, actually, you see, the, the lions, they have, uh, laser cannons that can kill any Pokemon they touch, um, and they also, they have, they have rocket boosters that they can fly, uh, and the symbiote, and... But as ridiculous as a lot of these arguments are, I get why they exist. The trouble with finding a definitive winner for this battle is that, well, lions are real and Pokemon are not. That may sound obvious, but it means that it's a bit like comparing apples and oranges. Because they exist in our real world, lions have very clearly defined rules that they have to follow. The Pokemon, on the other hand, exist in a sort of heightened video game world where the rules are never really super clear. It's hard to know exactly how these two groups would interact. But here's the thing, the world of Pokemon does have clearly defined rules. Just like our world is governed by the laws of physics, the world of the Pokemon games are controlled by the code, the various mechanics of the games. Things like base stats, type interactions, damage formulas, all these are fundamental forces in the Pokemon world that cannot be ignored. Now, a lot of you might be saying that these are just game mechanics, they wouldn't apply to a real life battle, but what are physics if not the game mechanics of life? Also no, the anime isn't canon. The main mechanic that I want to focus on today is PP. See, when a Pokemon drinks a lot of water or some other fluid, it produces a waste product that the body needs to expel- oh, oh, that's not the kind of pee we're talking about? Power points. Every move in the game has a given number of them, and when you run out, you can't use that move anymore. If you run out of PP on all of your moves, you're forced to use Struggle, which is kind of like a basic tackle, except every time you use it, you lose a quarter of your own health and recoil damage in the process. After struggling four times, a Pokemon is dead, or fainted, and then the lions can just come in and finish them off. If Pokemon are allowed to just ignore this basic law of their world, well, then I could sit here and say, well, fine, then the lions are able to ignore gravity. They can just fly up to Deoxys, bite them, no problem. So far from the limitless wells of power that most people assume they are, in reality, every Pokemon has a definitive shelf life, limited by their own PP. <laughs> and when they run out, well, it's only a matter of time before they struggle themselves to death. The only natural ways to restore a Pokemon's PP is by feeding them Lepa Berries, which the lions could just easily guard, or via the move Lunar Dance, which only Cresselia can learn, and it dies every time he uses it, so it's not ideal. Aside from that, the only ways to get PP back is with man-made items like Ethers, or by resting at a Pokemon Center. Things that our Pokemon army wouldn't have the opportunity to do because there's no people in this scenario. Now, I hear you. 
Um, a Pokemon can get its PP back just by resting. There are loads of beds throughout the Pokemon world where you can rest and fully heal your Pokemon. So every time a Pokemon sleeps, it gets all its PP back. But oh, contraire, my weirdly passive aggressive friend. That's a fine theory, but it's just not true. Moves like rest can allow a Pokemon to take a quick nap to restore all of its HP, but its PP never goes up. No matter how long you let it stay asleep, that PP isn't coming back. This means that simply getting a full eight hours isn't enough to restore any PP. I don't know what that old lady was doing with your Pokemon while you were sleeping, but it ain't natural. And again, if we are just going to ignore the rules and logic of the Pokemon world, then the lions just get an infinity gauntlet. That's how it goes. So, we know that the Pokemon's main limiting factor is their PP, and the lion's main limiting factor is that there's one billion of them. That means that all we need to do is find out how many lions the Pokemon could possibly kill before running out of juice. If that number is above 1 billion, then the Pokemon will probably win. If it's not, then they literally don't have a chance. And now, after that two and a half page preamble, it's time to get into the math. Hope y'all are ready, cause it's about to get crazy. First, just to play devil's advocate, let's take a look at the upper limit of a Pokemon's destructive capabilities, just to see the kind of firepower that our most powerful Pokemon are dealing with. If PP is the main limiting factor of a Pokemon, then moves that can take out multiple lions at once are going to be the most optimal. Luckily, there are a bunch of moves in Pokemon that can do just that. In a double battle, Earthquake, for example, can hit everyone on the field. Great, so we know these multi-target attacks can hit multiple lions on the field at once, but the question remains, how many? How big is this field? How far beyond the field does the move extend? A real earthquake can be felt 60 miles away from its epicenter, but as you'll soon see, a real earthquake this is not. For if we hop into generation 5 or 6 and enter a triple battle, we see that if a Pokemon in the corner uses Earthquake, it can only hit the Pokemon adjacent to it, not the ones on the far side of the field. This is true for all damaging multi-target attacks. There are certain moves that can affect everyone on the field, but those are generally things like weather, moves that affect the field itself and don't directly deal damage. So, if we can find the distance from the far left side of the field to the far right, we can find the maximum possible radius of an attack like this, which we can then use to find out how many lions a single move is realistically taken out. Stick with me. Unfortunately, Pokemon battles all take place in this sort of nebulous RPG battle zone. There's nothing around to provide a reliable sense of scale or anything. So you might think that this is impossible. Impossible? <laughs> My maniacal laugh isn't great. I present to you the Pokemon World Tournament, introduced in Pokemon Black and White 2, where you can engage in all sorts of battle formats, including, you guessed it, triple battles. We can see in the overworld that all of these battles, including the triple battles, take place on this octagonal platform. If all the battles are supposed to be taking place on this platform, then that means in a triple battle, if a Pokemon standing on one edge uses Earthquake, a Pokemon standing on the opposite edge would have to be outside of that radius. Make sense? So, if we know how big the platform is, we can find out how big the Earthquake can possibly be. This platform is eight tiles across in-game. In a previous video, I determined that each tile in Pokemon translates to roughly 25 inches on each side. To simplify things, if we assume this octagon is instead an 8x8 square grid, then a multi-hit attack must have a radius of, at the absolute most, 
seven tiles. If the attacker is standing on one corner, it can hit these seven tiles, but the one on the opposite corner has to be safe. In reality, it could be a bit less than this, but right now we are giving the Pokemon the absolute benefit of the doubt. If we assume that every multi-target attack can cause damage to everything in a sphere around the Pokemon who is using it, then with a radius of 175 inches, 25 inches per tile times seven tiles, all we need to do is bust out this old formula and we can find that the volume of this sphere is 12,990.6 cubic feet. Oh, what? Y'all thought I was going to come in here and talk about lion stacks or some nonsense? You didn't think I know my geometry? No, no, when I say I did the math, I mean I did the math. I did it hard. <laughs> Stupid. Let's assume for a minute that every single lion in this battle is female. Since they're usually a bit smaller, they can be packed closer together, and again, we are finding the best case scenario for a Pokemon. A female lion is, on average, four and a half feet long, excluding the tail, which they could tuck under them, doesn't really take up space, by 1.5 feet wide, by 2.8 feet tall. If we assume that each lion is roughly a rectangular prism with these dimensions, then one female lion takes up about 19.1025 cubic feet of space. If we assume that these lions are perfectly packed into a sphere shape, all piled on top of each other with our attacking Pokemon, an infinitely small point in the center, then each multi-hit attack could damage a maximum of 680 lions in a single go. For simplicity's sake, we'll assume that if a lion takes any damage at all, it's immediately dead. So, to put simply, if I lost any of you, in the absolute best case, borderline impossible scenario, a Pokemon could take out 680 lions with a single attack. That is an absolutely insane number of lions to kill with just one move, but it physically cannot reach any more than that. Oh, but we're not done just yet. We still need to find out how many attacks a Pokemon could possibly do. The multi-hit attack with the most PP is Magnitude, with a total of 48 if you completely maxed it out. Now, logically, it doesn't make sense for a move like Magnitude, which is supposed to be some sort of Earth Tremor, to damage everything in a sphere. Realistically, it would only hit things in a radius on the ground, which is a lot less lines. But again, I don't want anyone to say that I didn't give the Pokemon the fairest of shakes, so we'll assume it's some sort of magic sky quake, I don't know. Normally, a Pokemon can only learn each move once, but for the sake of argument, let's say that you were a sick hacker and your Pokemon was able to learn magnitude four times. I know it's impossible, you'll see why it doesn't matter in a second. With 48 PP per move, that is 192 magnitudes that this Pokemon could fire off before struggling to death. So, at 192 magnitudes and 680 lions killed per magnitude, if you're being perfectly efficient, that means that this hypothetical Pokemon, which is as good at killing lions as you can possibly get, can kill a grand total of 130,560 lions before struggling to death. If each struggle can also kill one lion, then that's another four to the pile. <laughs> and y'all thought this was some sort of game? You come out here asking me questions, you don't expect me to bust out dimensional analysis, huh? Admittedly, yes, that is a lot of lions, but we're getting into the realm of big numbers where everything starts to lose its meaning, so let's put things in perspective a bit and find out how many of these crazy killer Pokemon that can actually exist you would need to defeat all 1 billion lions. How many are you thinking? 100? 200? Try 7,660. You heard me right. Over 7,000. And remember, there are only 1,015 Pokemon in existence. So, uh, well, I mean, there you have it. 
not only can one of every Pokemon not hope to take down one billion lions, but even if every Pokemon was on the power level of Arceus, heck, even stronger, if every Pokemon was as efficient at killing lions as the laws of Pokemon possibly allow, they would get through just 13% of all the lions. The numbers don't lie, my friends. And all of that is assuming that the lions can never kill a Pokemon themselves, which is completely unrealistic because if we look at it from their perspective, the lions can afford to lose 985,221 of their ranks per every Pokemon they kill. That is 25 times more than the total number of lions that actually exist in real life, if we're being optimistic. A Pokemon could cause an instant mass extinction event 25 times over, and the lions would still be seeing green in their budget. All this time, we've been asking what the lions could possibly do to Deoxys, but the real question is, what could Deoxys do against the lions? The truth is undeniable. Based on the sheer geometry and the rules established in the Pokemon world, the lions don't have to do anything but wait. The Pokemon quite literally do not have the ammunition to possibly make a dent in the immortal army of lions. So there you have it. The question has finally been answered. I did the research, I did the math, and I can say with pure confidence that one billion lions would trounce one of every Pokemon and it wouldn't even be close. You can't argue with the numbers. All of this to answer a, d a dumb question that people argue about on, on Twitter sometimes. What am I doing with my life?